My name is Johnny Fox, aka Itch, aka that guy from the King Blues. And this is Three Chords and the Truth, the story of the King Blues, the best of season one. Now, during this time, squatting was entirely legal. So if you found an empty building and could change the locks and post a section six on the door, which is just a piece of paper that tells everyone this is a squat, the place was legally yours. The police weren't expecting much and were massively outnumbered by the anarchists. I remember running street battles with the police, coming home absolutely covered in bruises from police batons and feeling like I could do anything. We turned on the TV, lit up a spliff, and then something happened that changed the world forever. This is as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the firemen assembled here, the police officers, FBI agents. Amongst the activist circles I was by now running in, rumors began to circulate about a possible war between the UK and the US versus the quote unquote axis of evil, AKA anywhere with oil. And the UK published a dossier claiming that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, which could be used within 45 minutes. 20 years later and there is still absolutely no evidence that any weapons of mass destruction ever existed, despite 700 inspections being carried out. The standard set will consist of only two songs, each band playing two songs and swapping to the next band, the idea being that if the police came to shut it down or when the police came to shut it down, everyone had had a chance to play. Our favourite place to play was the Poison Club in Dalston, which was a row of shops that had been closed down. A German squatter had broken in, sledgehammered a hole through all the walls, creating this giant venue, hooked up the electricity and built a stage. On gig nights there were dogs outside who were trained to attack the police. There was a war going on and no one was talking about it. Like, not in, not in music, two million people marched without a soundtrack. The J18 riots, the May Day protests, the Wombles. There were squatted social centres springing up and down. There was a real feeling of, as Bob Dylan said, revolution in the air. With an idiot in the White House and a falling down in the street, both struggling with their economies and desperately trying to create enemies, and with the rise of the far-right British National Party, or BNP, it was a time of immense disinformation. Sound familiar at all? So whilst away we had the war raging, closer to home Nick Griffin's British National Party was sowing the seeds of hatred and fear. Although the BNP were founded by John Tyndall, it was decided Tyndall couldn't be the public leader due to his public admiration for Hitler and the Nazis. Therefore the leadership role was given to his friend and confidant Nick Griffin. Griffin would go on to be the snivelling middle class face of white supremacists. This battle at home felt more personal. He wanted to send my parents back to where they came from. He would get far too much airtime as the BBC fawned over his controversial views which brought in the viewing figures. At a gig I did at a left wing bookshop in King's Cross, a mobile phone was handed to me on stage. The gift giver told me, it's Griffin. All government buildings, hospitals and schools were allowed to be looted by the troops in place. A bomb was placed in a bank that rained down money on impoverished Iraqi citizens. The Ministry of Oil was the only government building protected by the troops. Every news source was now showing footage of Saddam's statue being pulled down, which of course the now anti-Black Lives Matter crowd was celebrating. As I record this, it's currently the 15th of January 2021. Yesterday, America announced it will begin pulling out another 2,500 troops from Afghanistan after 20 years, making it the longest war in American history. My favourite band ever in the world had come down to watch us. This was not how it was supposed to go. UK ska punk bands were supposed to tour 300 nights a year, play to maybe 50 people a night, and then quit through exhaustion and a lack of progress. But something was happening here. It was exciting. 
and I have a theory for why. 9-11 had happened and we'd become a war generation against the wishes of the majority of the nation and no one was talking about it in music. Indie bands would write songs about being in an indie band. The enemy would wet themselves over it, build the band up, then break them down to show their ultimate godlike power. People always come up to me about this album and they're like, what is up with your accent on the album? And why does it change on every album? And why is it so weird on Under The Fog? And the only honest answer I can give is... So I'm just going to quickly stop the track there to say the next voice you hear will be Jeremy Corbyn's... Yeah, man, we were early. The army were running adverts with the tagline, be the best. The working class in this country are constantly ignored, stepped over and looked down on until there's a war. All of a sudden, the narrative changes from dead end slobs to potential heroes. During our sound check, this guy run down and stops our sound check and he's like, our sound check. And he was like, everyone needs to be silent. Everyone needs to be silent. And I'd never seen anything like this in a venue before. I thought, what's going on? Is there some sort of terrorist thing happening? And it turned out that Shane McGowan was taking a nap. And he doesn't take naps often. And if there's any chance that Shane might sober up for a bit, the whole crew were like, all right, he's having a nap. All sound needs to be off. So, it, <laughs> I mean, this is in like a venue where we're checking snare drums one minute and it's super loud. And then suddenly... The whole Brixton Academy was intensely quiet because Shane was having his nap. And he had this tent on stage <laughs> where he'd come out and he'd do his bit. And then when his verse was finished and the fiddle player or like the tin whistle man was doing his bit, Shane would go into his tent and there was a table there just full of booze. And he'd have himself a shot, he'd have a, a ciggy. And then he'd come out of the tent and go back on and do his next verse. It was, it's just like a proper legend. Now, at the time, I was adamantly against any electric instrument. This had to be acoustic, raw and real. I wanted Buena Vista Social Club via a punk squat dripping insider. We made it to the car park and with the stealth movements of secret agents, we sneaked our way right up to the iconic stadium. Years later, we would play here and be amazed at how easy it was to get backstage without any kind of accreditation. If you really want to meet a huge band, just turn up hours early to the stadium with your instruments and look lost, and someone will eventually figure you as the support act. We had unknowingly parked smack bang in the middle of Belgium's biggest, and I would certainly say most active, dogging spot. Now, if I had a thought Glasgow was a little strange, I had not experienced anything to prepare me for Aberdeen. So I decided there and then that Belgium was probably not my kind of place. Coming from inner city London to suddenly being in the Scottish Highlands, looking now over winding mountains that pierced through the sky, and with the fresh icy air slapping our faces, we were in awe. There was natural running water flowing through the rocks and sheep grazing on mountain sides. The closest we'd come to this was Hackney Marshes or Camden City Farm who had a grumpy pig and not a lot else. This was actual nature, wilderness. You could shout until your lungs hurt and no one would hear you. You could run around naked like a caveman howling at the moon and no one would know. It was mind-blowing to me. There was nothing that could have prepared me for the night time. It was so extreme. The change from scenically beautiful. We could have been on the Lord of the Rings to pitch black, deaf black. Can't see two inches in front of your face. Black, utter nothingness. No light pollution, completely unaware of what you saw in the day ever existed. And then you look up and there are stars, not one or two like you sometimes see in London on a particularly clear night if you're lucky, but millions and billions of stars twinkling and shining and laughing at us. 
We've been here all the time, they seem to say. You just had to have faith. You just couldn't see us under the fog. Most inner city kids do not ever get to witness anything like that. It's one of the many experiences I'll always be grateful this band gave me. The venue was opposite the docks, and like some 1920s pulp fiction novel, the town was heaving with sailors on leave and prostitutes looking for work. Flash warned us that this was a very dodgy area, and we needed to be careful, which we laughed about. I mean, we were from Hackney, we ain't scared of no sailors. But by this point, we were a tough act to follow. We'd been learning, watching, studying, and soaking up everything around us. We were a different band to the one who started the tour. By the end, we were a solid unit. Shout out, and let's hear it for the King Blues. They were really great, right? The crowd roared. I wanted to scream, I'm here, behind this wall. A ray of yellow, dusty light pierced into the passageway and a confused looking bounce appeared in to see me run out like a startled mouse. The police came to investigate the claim of vandalism on the neighbour's front door. And when they went to the downstairs flat to question the man, they found the naked dead body of a sex worker lying on his bed. We had to hold our breaths walking past the bins in the flat. It was a few months later that we started to hear about the man downstairs again. Only this time it was on the news. Every channel had their cameras pointed at Stav's block of flats, where we've been recording all these demos. Switching between shots of the flats and shots of the bins, they kept on showing his picture and repeating his name. Anthony Hardy, aka the Camden Ripper. The policeman laid there unconscious, entirely knocked out, blood gushing from the back of his head. That was Three Chords and the Truth, the best of season one. Three Chords and the Truth, the story of the King Blues is available exclusively through patreon.com forward slash itchfox. That's patreon.com forward slash itchfox. The entirety of season one is up now. Season two drops next week. Until then, stay high, stay fly, peace and love.